welcome. Nonetheless, my name is uh, Reverend Dana Moss, and I am a third year curate based in the Romford area of the Chelmsford Diocese. Hopefully, some of you will know that that area. Um, for the last six months or so, I have had the privilege of uh, working one day a week with the mighty Chelmsford Diocesan Communications team, um, working on ways that we may build our digital mission and moving forward and all things um, online. And uh, the team is headed up by Tom Geldard, who hopefully you can see somewhere and might be waving at you as we speak. Uh, Tom is the uh, illustrious leader of the, of the team and all things communications for the diocese go through Tom and he does a great job. And we're also joined tonight with, uh, by James Cottis, who runs a company called Digital Spirit. And he essentially runs the diocese website, along with plenty of other churches around the diocese as well. And he essentially keeps us all on track and in good working order. Um, so my job tonight is essentially to hopefully steer us in the right direction, keep us on track a little bit. Uh, and just some notices, really, some housekeeping to begin with. Um, just so people know that these sessions are recorded. Um, as far as I'm aware, they are restricted to speak of you. So essentially anyone like myself right now who's speaking will be recorded. So you won't have to worry in general. Um, however, there might be a time when you want to ask a question or, or something like that. And so if you prefer not to be seen, please do feel free to turn off your screen or if you prefer then just let Tom or James or myself know and we can edit you out of any videos that were, these videos are posted onto the uh, Darcy's and website afterwards so if you prefer not to be in them just let us know and we can sort that out. Um, we're going to ask people to mute themselves or we'll mute you as you uh, come into the to the session tonight. Um, and it just essentially just throughout the two presentations, you know, just, you know, in case we were just talking earlier on about snoring dogs or, you know, things going on in the background. For me, sometimes it's people in my house singing in the kitchen. Um, so we just ask for people just to mute yourselves. And there's going to be some some, uh, some sessions or some sections uh, for questions uh, throughout after each sort of little short talk that we're going to be hearing from uh, Tim and Sarah and Nicholas in a while. And when it comes to those times, uh, we'll have, you know, opportunity for questions. So if you want to raise a hand or just indicate in some way, and Tom and James and myself will be keeping an eye on some stuff. And um, we'll invite you to unmute yourselves to ask your question, etc. cetera. Um, alternatively, or as well as if you'd like to, feel free throughout the session to write any questions or comments or anything like that you've got into the chat box. And we'll keep an eye on those as well. And we'll pick them up as we go. Um, and then just finally, unless Tom wants to add anything after that, um, there is an option for subtitles or closed captions. I think they're on and they're working. Um, and so if you go to your kind of Zoom toolbar at the bottom, you'll see an option for closed captions and you can just turn them on or uh, activate them uh, as and when you please obviously be aware that you know sometimes they interpret words a slightly wrong way so just you know be aware of that little caveat um but that's essentially uh in terms of housekeeping unless tom wants to add anything um the plan for this evening is uh, really it we've listed tonight as a digital foundations building a mission strategy for your online community but really what tonight is it's a uh, two uh, practitioners, if you will, two experienced or what I call experts in the field um, who have been doing this stuff for a while throughout the pandemic. And we're going to hear from them in turn. And then after each uh, session, each talk, we're going to have some time for questions, like I said, and then we'll round off at the end and sort of say some farewells. And um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to attempt to stop sharing my screen for a moment. Oh, I can see everyone now, there you are. And um, I'm gonna hand over to Tim and Sarah.
Okay, there we are. Managed to successfully unmute, so that's the first hurdle done. So we are Tim and Sarah, and we're pioneer ministers in North Colchester. I very cheekily label myself a pioneer minister as well, although Sarah's the one with the who's ordained and with the job. And uh, but it's very much a team effort, not just me and Sarah, but our whole family. We started using technology a new way in a new way during lockdown and we're going to talk you through a little bit about how that's worked for us. Um, Alan very kindly described us as experts. Uh, I'm not sure I'd concur but we're certainly practicing and learning as we go. So Covid has given us the excuse and permission if you like to try out things online which we've done and, and generally speaking it's been very well received apart from a little bit recently but we'll, you'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. We've been putting posts on secular Facebook pages and links to our YouTube channel that we started when COVID started. We have three children, so please bear in mind that one of us may get called away. Uh, in the 20 minutes we've been here, I think we've been interrupted three times already, at but least, at least but, but one of us will manage that. Um, but without further ado, if that's okay, I think um, Alan will share a video which will give us a little bit of an oversight in what we do. We are Tim, Sarah, Joel, David, Levi and Lottie. Uh, we are on a new housing estate in Colchester. We were sent here by the Bishop of Colchester to pioneer. Um, pioneer a, a worshipping community. So that means we have no church, we have no building, we have no gathered community um, and we had six months in the role of just getting to meet people, getting to know people um, and starting to have ideas and then this happened. There's a nasty germy worm in the air. There's a nasty germy worm in the air? Yeah. Yeah, so what do we do? We stay away from the people. Stay away from the people? Yeah, there's no, no, there's no school and there's no nursery. There's no school and there's no nursery. No, no school and no nursery. But here we saw an opportunity for the love of Jesus to be shown um, in lockdown and for that love to enter right into people's homes and hopefully hearts through their PCs and through their devices. Um, the world came crashing down and people were looking on their devices, on social media. They were looking for answers, they were looking for entertainment, they were looking for support, they were looking to see what was going to happen next and um, looking for company. And so we took the opportunity. The problem is I don't really have the IT skills. The good news is I am an experienced vicar and I'm very good at delegating and the even better news is I'm married to someone who loves IT, loves technology and so this happened. We started daily films with a message of faith, a message of hope from our household to yours. We began with just an iPhone, a basic iPhone and gradually developed skills over time. Throughout all of these videos we had some key values. The whole family would demonstrate every member ministry. We meet people where they are. Contents would be spiritual and not religious. The delivery would aim for mutuality. Not me telling you but us getting through this together. We would keep our structure short, flexible, visual and stimulating. The films led to discussions and opportunities for other things. We began online alpha courses. From the first alpha course we started a prayer group. We began to link the films with things that we were able to do out and about on the estate in between lockdowns. After 10 months of sharing videos online we had a complaint from a Facebook administrator. 
people had been complaining to them and he then passed the complaint on to us. We hadn't realised how much of an impact we had until we posted one more video explaining that we were stopping our daily prayer videos on Facebook. We've been able to answer people in these comments that we're not giving up, we will adapt and we will change. So we're still posting links to our weekly films that are on YouTube. Anyone that's seeing the links to our daily prayers, we're inviting them to make Facebook friends with us directly because we're still able to post them on there. And God knows what next. But the encouragement is, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors or in people's hearts. But God is using what we do to reach out to people. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you could see that and hear that okay. But that's an example of the kind of films that we've been making or Tim's been making on his iPhone. So I'm going to ask him a couple of questions now about how he makes the films. And then I will just go through some of the, the mission or strategy side of it and the values that we outlined in the video. So Tim, can you tell people... Um, what how what technology you use to make these films so <clears throat> initially it, it was just an iphone um and a computer um and the filming was all done on an iphone once the films are made then uh, i then download them to the computer and then from the computer onto youtube uh, the reason that uh, i was doing it in that order you can download directly from your phone to youtube However, we took the decision to um, go with YouTube Premiere um, as an option. And what that means is that you schedule a time when the film effectively goes live for people. And it means that the people that are watching the um, audience or participants know that they're watching it at the same time as we are. And you can only download, you can only upload videos to Premiere from a computer, not from a phone. So two pieces of equipment, really, an iPhone and a computer. Um, and can you tell people why you decided to go for something um, pre-recorded rather than live? OK, well, you may well see an example of why throughout our little bit later on. We've got three children, as you saw on the clip, and um, also a dog. And you know what they say, never um, work with children and animals. Which, whereas we work with them every single week and um, maybe one day I'll do an outtake video and um, it might give people an idea of why we don't do things live. So there's two reasons really. One is you never quite know what the children are going to get up to. But the other reason is um, sometimes when you go to traditional churches, not all, not all churches, but just sometimes you'll see um, a service and you'll see children start to make a noise and a fuss and parents are quick, very quickly, shh, don't make a noise in church. And we wanted to give people the freedom to watch it in their pajamas, if that's what they felt like doing with their kids climbing all over them and eating breakfast and getting it in their hair. Um, so we wanted to give them the freedom to be able to engage with it whatever time of day they wanted in whatever way they wanted. Great. And um, could you tell people, I'm conscious that people are probably very busy, especially if you're homeschooling and all the rest of it, working at home, working from home. Can you um, tell people how long it takes you to make a film like that? Um, and maybe any tips for saving time? Um, OK, so it, it can take quite a long time, um, but the more you practice, the quicker it gets. Um, and there's two sorts of things we do. One is we've been doing um, daily prayers throughout January. Um, not the lit liturgical prayers, but kind of a daily prayer that reflects what's going on in society um, with a, bi a Bible verse that applies to it and then a short prayer. And because we've done that every day throughout January, we've got a standard um, title slide um, and then a Bible verse and a, and a little prayer at the end. And I can put that together. They're about two to three minutes in length and I can put one of those together in 10 minutes now. Um, including getting it from start to published on YouTube or Facebook. Um, our week film, our weekend films, which are effectively, um, I suppose, a service for people that know nothing about church and Christianity. Um, 
they take me longer to do because there's lots of different bits of filming involved in that and then editing it all together. So that can take anywhere between about four to eight hours. The longest bit of which is um, uploading the video from the phone to the computer and then from the computer to YouTube. That's the biggest chunk. Um, but they can, it can take as, as um, much or as little time as you've got really. Um, it just depends on how long you want the films to be, who your target audience is and what you're aiming to achieve. Okay, so um, who is your target audience um, and how, like what method are you using to reach those people? Um, what evidence have you got in the way of, can you believe that's the doorbell? <laughs> Who's calling at our house during a lockdown? Um, it's not pizza. No. No, um, we'll just see if a child answers the door, but then that's not very safe, is it? Joel, number. can you answer the door, please? Anyway, back to it. Um, can you tell people who's watching and do you get, is there a way of monitoring or statistics that give you a sense of who's watching? Okay, we know who our target audience is because obviously we are on um, a new housing estate and as part of that we're on um, two Facebook groups, this housing estate and the one next door. So they're really our target audience. Um, and Sorry, I'm just half listening what's going on at the door and making sure the children are okay. Um, sounds like it. Um, so our target audience is the people who, whose estate we're on. Um, you don't know who specifically is watching, um, but you can tell overall statistics. So we can tell number of views. We can tell roughly um, how long people are viewing for. So this will be one of the big things that we've learned. Our weekly videos are approximately 20 minutes between 20 and 30 minutes in length we've always made it an aim not to go over 30 minutes but from youtube we can tell that the average viewing time is between seven minutes and about 14 minutes and that varies by film but that's kind of the average so on average not many people are watching through to the end so that one of the big things we learned and it's one of the reasons we've been doing shorter daily prayers is actually when people are picking things up and watching it on their phone or watching it on devices that they've got around the house they want the message whatever it is to be very quick so now we're aiming for two to three minutes um, and the idea is that we sort of consolidate things in the, in the weekly videos that are a bit longer so um, can I ask you as a final question, um, do you have plans to start meeting physically? How would you make that transition? And what's your plan sort of post COVID or post pandemic lockdown uh, with the digital side of things? Okay, so um, I'd want to keep the digital, or we want to keep the digital side of things going and um, actually build on it further. So the kind of next steps we're thinking about, well, the first thing is to say that we, we're trying to gradually integrate when we can activities that we do outside the house on the estate with the things that we're doing online. So for example, in between lockdowns and before Colchester went into tier four, we managed to squeeze two COVID safe outside events in. One was a distance outside carol service by gospel um, choir and the other, was um, an elf hunt where we put invitations through everybody's house, invited them to display an elf of their own or the invitations had a picture of an elf on in their window. And then through Facebook, invited children to go around and spot as many elves as they could, turn up to outside our house where we had um, a selection, chocolate selection pack to hand over along with a make at home nativity kit. And in that nativity kit was a link to a YouTube video which explained to the children how to how to make the nativity kit but also included a puppet show on the Christmas story um, so it had the nativity puppet show as well as instructions on how to make it so that's a small example of how we've tried to integrate things moving forward uh, we would um, and like to try and set up an online church first um, through a website and again, we promote that through the local Facebook pages. And then ultimately, we would see that as um, meeting together. 
but the kind of interim step would be to do the services in the way that we do it now. Um, I call them services very loosely and then perhaps have a Zoom chat afterwards. So people get to watch it in their own way and then they can come together to discuss anything they want to talk about afterwards. And that's kind of the interim steps that we're thinking between where we are now and ultimately where we want to get to. I also should say that we're waiting at the moment the only place we would have to meet were we able to would be our house because as Sarah said at the beginning there is no building that comes with this project yet although there will be a community centre at some stage so long-term aim is meeting in the community centre but there's a few steps in between and no guarantees and no guarantees so do you plan to keep going with the online worship absolutely yeah um I, I can't tell you exactly what it will look like because it does seem to evolve um and actually that that's what needs to happen because we've very much been um, making the films to respond to the current situation to try and meet people very much where they're at but you'll talk a little bit more about values in a second I guess yeah that's a that's a neat handover um can we have is there um a powerpoint slide that you could put up for us yeah, so I'm we'll just gonna do. I'm just gonna run through some uh some of the sort of missional values side of things. So um, in terms of a, a strategy, the basic strategy is, is, is listening and responding. So um, all the values that we've, that we've put there on the screen that were in the film as well, are things that we've picked up through years of parish-based ministry um, and they applied pre-COVID um, they've applied during COVID and they will apply after COVID. So they're, they're principles for mission generally um, that we, we've specifically put into the, into the digital side of things. So if I just go through them to um, expand a little bit, um, David said um, about every member ministry and you know something we've picked up is people do want to be involved. They want to offer something of value and a lot of people feel they've not got much to offer and actually by um, children participating people see something that is it's not polished it's not perfect it's not particularly theological but it's real and we're we're, we're validating it and saying that that is acceptable you know a, a clumsily worded prayer is still a beautiful prayer um, I'm conscious that we want to attract younger people into our churches and so specifically having their contributions matters because it's it's making them welcome and and validating them and actually if you put something on for the children the parents also participate if you put something on for the parents they only participate if the children have got something else to do um, so you sort of you know do something for the whole family then you, then you win the whole family's um, attention as it were one of the things we found is um at right at the start of lockdown um with the clapping for the nhs and everything we did a lot of praying and the boys were praying and people were moved to tears by that and it would have been it wouldn't have worked if it was a prayer from me or tim it was the fact that it was the children praying for the adults so um although those prayers can be quite sort of uh they can be quite distracted, they can be looking all around the room, they get the words all in, or, you know, they use the wrong words, but actually they have real value for the, for the, for the general public. Um, and I think for us, if the worship we're producing works for us as a family, then it sort of works for pretty much any other family. So that's a, another principle that we would go by. Um, so that's that's every member ministry and then uh, Levi the little one he said we meet people where they're at and then we were saying we're actually literally physically during lockdown people are literally at home like behind a locked door back in the day when you could only go out for an hour a day at the most so we were like we have to find a way of actually getting right into people's homes and we were conscious that everyone's looking at their devices. So you can literally get into someone's like back jeans pocket as it were, because they're looking on those phones all the time. So, 
but we also wanted to meet people where they're at emotionally and so we identified the emotions people were going through like shock and then there was fear um, there's been some frustration you know um, and grief obviously so we've um, picked those things up and then we've listened out for what's current um, at the moment it's snowdrops snowdrops are bringing hope for people um, it was rainbows obviously at one point for us on the estate Halloween was a big thing so we sort of tapped into that um, Black Lives Matter is another example where you know the whole world was engaged so we we engaged with that as well um, and the mood of the nation really changes and we saw it most dramatically from Christmas through to New Year everybody at Christmas was on on a high, even though it was tearful, everybody put their heart and soul into having a good time. And then by the time we got to New Year, um, it was like, we're all fully locked down and we're not even going back to school. And the, the mood of the nation had just like plummeted. So all of our films and stuff, prayers are reflecting that. So we're just listening and responding all the time. Um, I think David said about uh, spiritual, not religious. So we've avoided using Christian language. We talk a lot about the head and the heart and the feelings and the emotions. We don't mention words like liturgy um, and we don't tend to use much liturgy, although we do use repetition. Um, we use Bible passages that don't require any background knowledge. They're not too complicated to understand. Um, but we are always telling the gospel, um, just the bits that people will, will find most relevant. So it's been like knowing that, that Jesus cares, that he heals, that he's with us, that he saves, um, those kind of things. And then I think Joel talked about mutuality. So not me telling you, but us getting through this together. And that's really interesting because Joel is 13. And he's already got slightly indoctrinated by the church. So when he does the talk, he already does slightly do the, the I'm going to tell you. And we have to sort of address it, don't we? And say, so, well, no, no, this is this is us kind of just sharing a bit of stuff about us and hoping it's helpful. So um, that's something that we're, we're adapting to. Um, but it's things like we don't wear the dog collar because it's, it's just an ordinary family talking to another ordinary household. We use the word we rather than you. We try and angle the camera so we're not looking down at people. I think those sort of things do matter. And then we, we, we let people see the house in like, you know, most of the time it's in total chaos. And we quite often look tired and haggard and scruffy and we've got chocolate around our mouths and we just sort of go with that because we're 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 trying to be ordinary and um, not showy and we also finding points of commonality with people so you know if your house is in a mess so is ours and if you're surviving by eating chocolate well, so are we and, and those kind of things and then Joel said about the structure so it's it's short flexible visual um, and stimulating um, you know, just as, as Tim said earlier, just to appeal um, and stop people from turning off because it, it's harder to keep the attention, I think, perhaps than it online than it is in, in real life. And then there's a further strategy of anonymity. So we, we actually don't probe people. We don't ask them if they've watched the film and we're just letting them join the community from a distance. And I think that's that's probably also really important. And that's probably enough information. Are you still there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is anyone still there? <laughs> yeah. Okie doke. That's. Uh... There we go. I can see you again there as well. That's helpful. <laughs> okay. Great. Oh, well, thanks yeah. so much. Thanks, Tim and Sarah. That was awesome. I I, I was like making notes and all kinds of stuff there as well so um so the idea now really is we've got um it can bang on time as well i um, guess it can you hear me by the way yeah okay good me. yeah yeah good so i was just i was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, chatting away and people are like um yeah bang on time by the way strong work strong work so um 
we've got about 15 minutes for questions and I'm just wondering whether I mean if people has anyone got any questions straight off if you want to raise your hand or um, if anyone's got any questions if yeah if they raise their hand or if they can put them in the chat and we'll get to you think anyone's I can't see any uh Jane yes Jane's got a question I'm just gonna imagine. sorry it always seems to be me um I'm trying to phrase this I don't want to come across as rude because I'm not trying to be at all um however almost everything you talked about was very much the family and um and I wondered whether you what you're doing to outreach people maybe who aren't part of a nuclear family or don't identify with family and whether that's part of your demographic and what you might be doing for them? Um, largely it is the demographic, yeah. So contextually we're on a housing estate and they're big family houses. Um, but, but you're right and we're very conscious when we do things that we um, like, we give an example where like this would be something for homeschooling or if you're on your own, perhaps you would do it this way. So we're always putting it out there and there is surprise, there's a surprising lot of people that have connected, like mainly from uh, like our previous churches. And they are, they're single people and they're um, older people. Sometimes they're people who haven't got children um, and they're really appreciating it. So it's so, I think, I think sometimes if people haven't got children in their family home and actually they can't get out and about and see children, even if it's like a niece or a nephew or the next door neighbour's children, they're appreciating a bit of family life. But yeah, we have to be sensitive about that. And I thank you for that question. And it's not rude. Awesome. Thanks. There's uh, a couple of questions come through. One from Rachel. Um, so, uh, so she's asked, what was the issue with using Facebook and having to move to a private page? Are there some lessons to be learned? Um, good question. Um, so both the Facebook groups we belong to are um, run by administrators and they're private groups that you have to be invited into, which we are invited into because we live on one of the estates, but also because we do things on the other. Um, and people didn't complain to us directly, but a few people, I don't, I'm not quite sure of the number, complained directly to one of the administrators who contacted me rather embarrassed in a private message to say he'd received this complaint. Oh, here we go. Um, this looks like an interruption. Can I carry in with that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I think I would just want to say um, from the outset that um, we started putting posts out back in March and we were very conscious that these are secular pages uh, people aren't expecting religious content um, and so we we put them out there very gently um, avoided using words like um, Christian worship or church so that we could so that the administrators wouldn't throw us off the of the sites because it's about it's about the mission and the evangelism and so um, whilst the complaints um, have come in the last few days this is the last week or so yeah. I feel really grateful that we've managed to keep them on there since March um, that's ne nearly a whole year of putting um, of putting Jesus and mentioning Jesus like every day or every week on on two secular pages mm -hmm. so um, I think the lesson that the lesson that I would pick out of that is um, actually making sure we don't use uh Christian jargon or call it worship or call it prayer unnecessarily um so we're not pretending it's something that other than it is but we're we're just saying things like you know are you looking for hope um you know anyone can identify with that they, they don't need to be a Christian whereas if we were saying you know this is morning worship that that's got that's got a, a Christian um Anglican overtone to it so yeah and the the, just to clarify as well, Sarah, these are local Facebook community groups? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. because we're pioneering, so we, we have been placed by the bishop onto an estate in order to um, create, uh, to evangelise and um, create a Christian community on the estate, yeah. 
I cut in on you, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Um, there's a, a question actually related to your role as pioneers um, from Nicholas Ellis. Um, as pioneer ministers, can you use a church near you? And if so, how? And how does your website fit into the overall digital strategy? OK, so we haven't used a church near you. Um, Sarah is associate um Minister, vicar, associate vicar, priest, I don't yeah. know, associate something associate or other. Associate minister. Associate minister at St Michael's in Myland. So we're, con we're connected with them. Um, so, but, so we haven't put anything on a church near you. And the question, what was the second part about the website? How does... Uh, how does your website fit into your overall digital strategy? I guess asking just, you know, did, will it factor in as well, you know? Yeah, so um, one of the ways we've we've been mulling over in the last few days since we got the um, complaint via the administrator on the Facebook page is how can we still signpost people to content um, without necessarily um, offending anyone on the page? So one of the ways we've come up with that is actually if we develop a website which has its own flavor, we can point people to the website rather than pointing people, rather than having a, a video that auto plays when they go onto Facebook, which is what was happening with the daily prayers. So it's, it's kind of an interim step between meeting people on Facebook to getting them in a physical location. And the website is kind of the, it's part of the bit in between those two things. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Uh, we'll find out i think it does but if nicholas if you've got any comeback just post it or let us know um in the meantime uh wendy has uh, asked uh, do your children ever get tired of doing a service every week um and do you intend to try and include anyone else from your community in your services like via zoom or any other platforms in the future um, I'll answer that one. Um, the children do get tired and then we sort of, you know, if they don't want to do them, they, they don't. And some, some of our films are more children uh, in them than, sometimes it's more me and Tim and it's because they've, they've lost interest. But then we're slightly conscious if they've lost interest and perhaps we're not doing something that's engaging for them. So it, it makes us think again about how to be creative. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't always want to participate. In terms of involving other people, um, when we started back in March, we actually didn't really have, there, there were no other Christians on the estate that we, that we knew of really. So, um, and certainly with a Christian family that go to a very different church and, and we're integrated. So we didn't have other people to involve. Now I think I think we could now, except that it's quite complicated safeguarding wise to sort of ask them to send videos and things. So we haven't done. But what one of the things we'd like to do in the future when we're meeting in them, um, hopefully meeting in the in a community centre or even in our house is actually like when we're doing children's activities is, is to film it, obviously, in a safeguarded way with permission and everything, and then use that as part of the film that people could then share on their Facebook pages to so that granny and grandpa can see what they've been doing. And, and I think that could be that could be a really exciting thing for the future. Um, so that that's a thought, yeah, going forwards. But at the moment, it is just sort of us in our little lockdown ministering to you in your little lockdown. <laughs> awesome. Um, and Nick has confirmed that that did answer the question. So that's good. Um, has anyone else got any other questions? If you, I'm seeing ones in the chat, but if you want to, if anyone with a video and wants to, I mean, if not, I've got a, a oh, sorry, have you seen one? No, it's because, no, I can't see anyone. I was just going to say. Sure. Well, I was just going to write, like, because in terms of the uh, pioneering and things like that, you know, obviously, you know, you're doing something very particular with a particular calling and stuff. When it, uh, comes to um, all the tech stuff that you've been talking about. Obviously, you know you got Tim there. You know he's doing a, putting all the stuff together. Um, 
look, someone like me, you know, I'm, I'm the same as you kind of out in the community as much as possible, but I may not have the same editing skills and stuff. Have you got any kind of advice, unless this has already been asked and I've not picked it up, of like how a newbie might do what you do in terms of putting things together and stuff? Um, so I think if you've got, like, if you're interested in giving it a go, um, it's going to sound a really boring answer, but but trial and error and playing and just um, so like when I watch a film or I see something on television, I'm I'm always kind of like, how do they do that? And, and that would be really something I you know I'd like to see if I can try and do. So to start with, it was literally just my phone um, filming um, Sarah talking or me talking or the or the children doing a bit of craft, mm. and it was as simple as that to start with. And the editing and putting it together. Um, I mean, I can talk about an iPhone. I can't talk about the apps on an Android phone because I don't have one, but there are equivalents. Um, but I use iMovie, which is so intuitive. It's literally just a matter of swiping a couple of things with your finger and seeing what it does. Um, and then if you don't like it, you can just click undo um, and then try something else. So it was literally just a matter of doing that to start with. And then as things have progressed, I've I've tried to do th a few things with... Um, so I've used PowerPoint um, and then save that as a video rather than a presentation. And then um, without boring too much technical detail, but then I've put it in Google Drive and then from Google Drive onto my iPhone and then used iMovie to incorporate it. Um, I've done things like green screens now. So we've, when we've done a puppet show, I've had the puppets appearing in front of a green screen and then, um, then they, you know, for the nativity story, then they're in, in a stable and then they're in, in the desert as a camel walking along the road. Um, so it's just gradually evolved. And I, and I suppose it's play around with it, do what you enjoy, see what you think is grabbing people's attention and see, is there a way I can do that in my own home? Um, and Google, as usual, is a, is a mine of information. Um, I think also asking other people at the moment, yeah. there's so much out there because we're all having to do online um, that, you you know, if you see someone doing something, we've had people contacting Tim, or, you know, you just say, well, how did you, how did you do that? And we can all learn from each other. And, and there's a really good opportunity for that at the moment because we're all trying to do it. So, yeah, and I'm a long, long, long way from an, ex an expert. I've joined a Facebook group called it called something like um clergy tech or something and um 90 of what i read on there i haven't got a clue what they're talking about I, so, I'll, i've le I've learned something very important um if it doesn't work you just turn it off and turn it on again <laughs> that's what that's what he always tells me <laughs> just turn it off and turn it on again yeah that's that's like 50 percent of the advice tom gives as well throughout the diocese <laughs> Is that, have you tried to turn it on? Okay. Um, yeah, and no, also, and that's helpful because we've been, some of the webinars we've done recently have been basics, you know, people, I like the fact that you said, you know, a lot of the stuff you just do on a phone, you know, because it, it, we're trying to get away from this idea that people think, you know, they, it's good to buy equipment and big setups like Nicholas will probably talk about in a while with like places like a cathedral and stuff. But when you're sort of limited to home, people think they need to buy loads of expensive stuff. And you know, like you say, you can do it with a with a phone. And yeah, there was um, one more question. Oh, sorry. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say we want to keep it homegrown, but I mean, like, I mean, you would saw from the four minute video we did. Um, it's not massively polished, but actually, we don't want it to look too professional because then um, the idea is that we relate to other families where they're at, and if we're doing this kind of television production standard. Um, BBC Hayward. Yeah, BBC Hayward. Then it's, it's not, <laughs> not going to kind of reach people where they're at. Yeah. Um, it's good enough. Yeah. And that's that gradually great. we've added on more things, but um, it's very gradual as we've, we felt comfortable, really. Yeah. Then as you go. Um, uh, so then there's another a question from uh, Rachel. Um, do you use music? And if so, are there any good free resources that you could re recommend, uh, you know, with CCLI streaming licenses in place? Um, <laughs> nothing free that I could recommend, um, particularly that, again, this is worth a Google because there are, um, when the pandemic started, lots of different individual publishing companies 
have made some of their stuff available as long as you credit them um, for it. But I couldn't give you a list of those. It would be a matter of Googling. Um, but it's worth joining a Facebook group like um, something like um, technical clergy or clergy. I can't remember exactly what it's called, clergy tech or something, um, because they have those sort of discussions on there. And every time somebody finds a free one, they put the details on there and you can find that. Um, but we we did pay for an annual license for something called I Sing Worship, um, and that enables you to um, meet the CCLO requirements um, and put incorporate songs into some of our services, which we do. There's not a, there's not a huge huge selection on there, but there's kind of enough that we can find works most of the time. Great, thanks. I've made a note of that as well. But yeah. Awesome. Um, are there any other questions? We've just got uh, like a minute or so. Oh, James has put a link in there to I Sing Worship. Cheers, James. So if you yeah. want to check that out, you can uh, follow that link. We found out the hard way that um, YouTube just won't publish it if you've put something on there that's copyrighted. So you almost don't need to worry because it just doesn't get past YouTube. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. I'm just having a quick look. It's called Techno Clergy, the Facebook group. Techno Clergy. Right. Techno Clergy. So everyone's on their phone now. Quick, go get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not a clergy person, and they let me on there. So. <laughs> All right. I was going to say I, I haven't got my dog collar on tonight, as I, I'm not. I'm not legitimate. But yeah. <laughs> Okey doke. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Tim and Sarah. That was awesome. I uh, loads of loads of awesome tips as well. And like you say, sort of. Uh, there's plenty of ways of doing it from home as well, in case you, you're scared. If you've got a phone, you can do something, hopefully. But thanks so much. Awesome. And I, I'm guessing you guys, I mean, obviously, unless you've got to run off for the kids, but if you're around for a little bit, so if people have got any questions, pop them in the, uh, in the chat. And if Tim and Sarah, if you want to have a look in the chat and if you see anything yeah. pop up. Um, other than that, uh, we're going to move on. And this is good. We're two minutes ahead of, of schedule. So, uh, so we're going to hand over to Nicholas and he's going to sort of share from his perspective, you know, what the Chelmsford Cathedral, Nicholas has been in Chelmsford Cathedral and they've been doing some awesome stuff and had some, some upgrades. And so, yeah, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I've always thought the mute button for somebody like me is a really important function. So, uh, so 20 minutes in, please just mute me and I'll just carry on talking to myself really. Um, yeah, I'm Nick or Nicholas. I'm, I'm very happy to answer to both. Um, I'm the Dean of Chelmsford, but I spent um, half my ministry in inner city Newcastle. So um, life has been very different in different places. And um, I've been here seven years now and I inherited a cathedral uh, seeking to um, rebuild really its relationship with the diocese, with its context and with lots of partners. Um, I came to faith in an adult way at about the age of 17, very dramatically. I mean, I grew, grew up as a Christian, but um, reading the last verses of Acts chapter 2 uh, and uh, in case you don't recall those immediately the core line for me is and all the believers were together that's three words in Greek esto avto in the same place and, and that phrase is used again and again in the Acts of the Apostles that gathering together for worship for fellowship for learning and for service is critical is really like the foundational thing for the mission of the church indeed Acts 2 ends with that line of the Lord added daily to their number those who are being saved so evangelism not as the specialist activity of individuals but as the act activity of the church the church is a sacrament of god's kingdom for the world so gathering you know has been fundamental to my understanding of ministry i spent a couple of years of my life living in monastic communities where gathering for prayer four or five times a day is fundamental to the daily life of, of a human being um, and i've worked in in a couple of cathedrals uh, i've been a vicar of three different kinds of churches and I find myself um, as a I'm Mancunian married to a Geordie who spent most of his life in the Northeast. Can you imagine what it's like finding yourself in Essex? You know, it's a bit like moving abroad, but I like I like living abroad. So that's all right. You know, so that's never been a problem. Um, and and actually just grappling with the culture uh, has been really interesting in those early years. And then, of course, the last 18 months. Well, let me actually begin a tiny bit earlier than that. Kind of providentially, we discovered. It'll be, it will be 18 months, maybe even two years ago now, that one of our junior church mums was a social media specialist who was taking time off work to look after her kids. 
And so we said to Claire, how about it? You know, do you want to do some stuff with us? Now, I know cathedrals can have a wild reputation for being massively overstaffed and massively overwealthy. Chelsea Cathedral is the second smallest cathedral in the country, with possibly the smallest cathedral staff of any cathedral. There are several churches in the diocese with bigger staff than the cathedral has. Um, and we, ha we have a very limited budget. We have probably the smallest resources of any cathedral in the country and no historic resources. So we don't have lots of money to spend. But we managed to scrape some money together to pay Claire to work one day a week and one hour a day just to basically sort out our social media, because that was a pretty catastrophic, catastrophic scene, really. Um, so we had Claire sort of in the background there. And then I went away for four months on sabbatical and came back literally two weeks before lockdown began. And we didn't know what to do. Here we were confronted. Here's a cathedral where our basic job is to pray together twice a day and three times a day on a Sunday. So I mean, that's, that's the kind of key life, life that, that builds everything around it. And for whom gathering is absolutely fundamental. But I don't just mean gathering for worship. Uh, the cathedral is used for all sorts of gatherings. Some of you will be there for, will have been there for large meetings or, or conferences or ordination retreats or ordinations even, but also it's used by the city, the county, the universities, all sorts of networks see the cathedral as, as a key part of their relationships. So what happens when your gathering place, your neutral convening space suddenly cannot be used as we suddenly found out around Mothering Sunday last year? And by the way, I haven't had my haircut now since uh, since then. So um, I'm sorry, it is normally a bit shorter than this. Actually, not very much, but you know, my vanity helps me to say that. Um, and the truth is, we have started and continued very simple. We made a decision very early on that even though it was possible to stream worship from the cathedral building, we weren't going to do that. Uh, we would on Sundays, yeah. Um, we'd, we'd stream a, a live service on a Sunday morning with or without a congregation, because as you know, uh, life's brought us many different gifts, shall we say, you know, 30 people, 12 people, 70 people, oh, no people at all. Um, and, and that's been, a, you know, a, quite a challenge on Sunday mornings. But our first decision was that our daily prayer, you know, which is absolutely, it's an obligation of cathedrals, it's what they exist for. So morning prayer at 7.45 and evening prayer at 5.15 would go online streamed from our own homes yes on a mobile phone uh, i think most of us all, you know, use android but somebody may use an iphone and four of us take that in turns now we thought we were just kind of fulfilling an obligation there no i don't think we thought that i think we thought we were doing embarking on a remarkable experiment but with no idea where that was going to lead we use very simple forms i mean we do in the cathedral we use pretty simple forms except when it's a sung service um, and so we kind of had a whole repertoire already of that uh, and well, we, we launched in. I was terrified. I, I have a background in BBC local radio. So I, I, the idea of actually having to see my face on screen was pretty horrific. So I didn't do that. All my colleagues do, um, but I, I've created this prayer space. It's just to the right of me here, um, where with candles and a few icons, that becomes the focus rather than me. And that became, I think, very helpful. I do address the camera often at the end and I do preach many sermons all the way through. That's become a very laid back form of worship, certainly compared with normal cathedral worship. And I think we were a bit astounded because you know, typically morning prayer is kind of four or five vicars and um, maybe two other people. And suddenly we began to realize that about 40 or 50 people were turning up every day. And that's continued. I mean, I, I, we saw a massive rise of the, obviously at the beginning that plateaued over time. But that's been the warp and weft of our daily offering. So morning prayer and evening prayer. And it's garnered a most extraordinary community. Some people who would not regard themselves as Christians. Um, some people who certainly don't live in this country as well. One rather wonderful person. I couldn't work it out for a while when people would say, Mary, good night, sleep well after morning prayer. I think this is mad. But she lives in California. So she comes to morning prayer before she goes to bed. I mean, that's the weirdness this, of this, this strange world of the internet where all of us are eternally available wherever you are in the world. My favorite person is Bernard. Uh, Bernard was a, sorry, is, is a Canadian lawyer who teaches at Pennsylvania State University. And uh, I, I didn't know that until he finally emailed me saying, I've been joining in the daily prayer at the cathedral and I'm not really a Christian, but in lockdown, I began to explore, you know, what Christian faith might feel like having grown up in a kind of Christian culture. and. Um, and now he's a member of, well, he will never, he will never visit Chelmsford, I'm sure, um, but he's a kind of committed member of our community in terms of our praying, our worshipping and our learning, all of which, of course, happens online. But as I say, our basic instrument has been an Android telephone. 
which has its, I mean, for, 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 for people like me who didn't have a Facebook account until March, that was quite a quite an interesting issue, how we how we kind of curated this and got used to it. Um, let me be clear about our choice of platform. Uh, and, and I think research has backed this up quite strongly recently. Um, we were clear that this is kind of basically been quite Anglican and quite cathedral, that Facebook was really important because it's absolutely accessible to anybody. You don't have to go through any other portal to get onto it. You don't even need an account, as I discovered later. Uh, and so that meant that anybody in the world could just pick it up, you know, work out where we were and join us in any way. We chose not to use Zoom. We do use Zoom for teaching and learning quite a lot, but we also use Facebook for teaching and learning uh, 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 quite a lot of things. But our Bible study on Sunday mornings, that's via Zoom, because that's curated and intended for a particular audience. So there's a kind of barrier there, there's a threshold. But just as the, the cathedral building itself doesn't have any thresholds, you don't have to climb a step to get into it. It felt very important to us that you didn't have to climb a step to get into our worship. So the choice of Facebook was absolutely deliberate. Um, and I think research has suggested that using Facebook has often built congregations, using Zoom has often retained congregations. I mean, it's not as absolute as that because we use both for both. We even use Teams sometimes just for fun, um, but that's another matter. So, so what we began to do, it seems to me, and I, I kind of, I would witter on theologically about this if I wasn't careful, I'll try not to do that too much. But for me, there was this whole issue about how, how virtual could be real how virtual could be real. I think there's a kind of whole book there somewhere, or at least a series of reflections. And I'm happy to do that at some stage. Um, and I think what I discovered, and I come from a very sacramental tradition. So what happens when we can't gather to receive communion, for instance? What happens when we can't gather to bless one another? Um, there was a papal rule uh, that introduced in the media age that if the Pope does his blessing and you're watching it live, you receive the blessing. But if you watch a recording, you don't. Now, I don't share in that kind of thinking. That doesn't seem to me very helpful at all. But I think what I began to discover personally, and I think it's been true of the team as a whole, is that as we went on this extraordinary journey and met people also going on extraordinary journeys, and every now and then on a Sunday morning, uh, when we were allowed back in the building out now and then, uh, somebody would come up to you and say, now you've never met me, but you know, I'm part of your community because I've been worshiping with you online. And that was quite moving. Oh no, not just quite moving. It was quite extraordinary to me um, that we were making contacts with people, um, many of whom had started that contact without any living faith or without any sense of being, a, well, I often, I often say it this way around. I, I've often suggested that the task of evangelism Oh, sorry, if God is the God we know him to be in Jesus Christ, then God has gone before us into every place and context we could ever dream of. And therefore, the God who's gone before us has already given hints and guesses to his being, his presence and his power. If that's the case, then the job of the evangelist seems to me is to help people name the God they already know, but have not yet been able to name. Or at least that's that's part of it. Those of you who know the work of Vincent J. Donovan will be very familiar with that kind of theological thinking. Um, so what I began to, to realize was that somehow we were giving people an opportunity to begin to name the gods whom they already knew, uh, even if they had not been able to name that God uh, for a lifetime. And that again was very moving. And the journeys of faith people began to share on screen. Sometimes in a way I felt was quite exposing. You know, anybody could be watching this, but we curated that quite carefully. Uh, I don't think we've had any wholly inappropriate posts, but we've had to be sometimes quite careful with that. I also began to realize and I now say it every time I was leading morning prayer this morning, I said, welcome as we gather to make a house of prayer together, the Chelsea Cathedral, Cathedral community without walls, a virtual community yet real. That's kind of my strap line at the beginning of every time of prayer that I lead. But I actually mean it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean I made it up as a strap line anyway, but I've discovered it for myself. But I didn't do morning prayer for 50 people this morning. I was a member of a praying community who were gathered together in one place. Now that one place was metaphysically real, not physically real, and yet it was utterly real. And I think that's a really interesting discovery that I couldn't have imagined. Um, as I say, you know, technologically, we're incredibly simple. I'll, I'll get onto the complex bit in a moment. Uh, and you must start beeping me if I go over time, and, uh, Alan, so be careful. <laughs> You know, I, I can talk for two hours. The BBC used to pay me to talk for three hours on a Sunday morning, and I and, uh, literally I did. So it can get worse. Uh, I did one in my last parish in Harrogate. I did preach for 55 minutes one Sunday morning, and nobody walked out. I think that was a success. Um, 
There have been other things going, going alongside this. I mean, James has been helping us with the rebuilding of our, our very out of date website, and that one day in the nearish future may become a reality. But we've actually made sure that what we're doing online, particularly with the daily prayer and the Sunday worship, is being backed up through our website, to a whole dedicated page called Church at Home. And that's become a bit of a brand. Um, there's also a couple of closed Facebook groups are, are on, are that, that we've curated around learning and environment and I think those have been very important even though quite a lot of the content is available on Facebook directly it's also specially curated on, on, on our website to make that available permanently and, and in a whole variety of ways although we have begun to discover and our new website will challenge this even more but of course you've got to update that stuff a lot uh, this is quite this we this has become quite time heavy and i think one of the questions for us going forward is if and when we emerge from these current lockdowns uh, and we've actually got to get on with stuff we haven't had had to get on with in the same way um finding the time and opportunity and energy to deliver some of what we're delivering at the moment is going to be a big deal um, i write a daily reflection on the gospel reading that goes out online not sorry it goes out through email um I also write a weekly letter that goes out both to 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 uh, an email, a large email group, and and as a uh, a live stream on our Facebook page. But that's been really fascinating. Those two exercises, personally, it's been an extraordinary spiritual exercise, but it's also been a very reflective exercise. Again, for people way beyond our community of faith, our chair of finance is not a Christian. Uh, he's just a brilliant chair of finance, but he's made it very clear to me that he uses the daily prayer stuff every day now. That we send out on email that's a really interesting thing isn't it what's going on there oh it's somebody discovering they can name a god they didn't know they already knew uh, to use my own language there uh, so that's been the warp and weft of what we do um, so prayer learning teaching reflecting uh, facebook is the key place for that backed up by our website um but do you remember do you remember june I don't know. I don't really remember June at all, um, apart from realising my holiday really wasn't going to happen. I was part of a little group with uh, Archdeacon Vanessa and a few other people uh, looking at a re-emergence strategy for the diocese. We genuinely believe, still in June, that we were going to, sometime in September, have a big service, say it's all over, isn't that marvellous, let's get back to normal. Now, it dawned on us quite soon that that was complete nonsense um, and that all the resources that we prepared were you know, completely pointless, to be honest. Oh, no, nice thinking. Um, and it was at that point that we as a cathedral community said, we've got to get beyond a mobile phone. It's great. It's great. It's fantastic for what we do in the daily prayer. I think it really works for that. Um, although I did have, I think I was doing the Eucharist on Ascension Day. And I actually managed to break my selfie stick that I was using as a tripod and the camera fell down the back of the table and I carried on regardless. So I watched it back and there's a wonderful moment where I not just disappear from view completely, but you know, they're but down the back on the carpet. And, and that has a certain hilarity to it. And I've never minded those, you know, it's when the fire alarm goes off halfway through a stream service. I find that particularly amusing. And at that point we began to realize we had to up our game in the building. If, um, uh, even if we weren't allowed to worship in the building, we might be able to worship from the building. Again, morning and evening prayer were never the point there. Uh, it, this is about Sunday worship and also events, teaching, uh, things like the uh, the arrival of a new bishop, although that ended up on a mobile phone too. No, he didn't. He under a laptop, I think. <laughs> uh, that was a Zoom thing. And so we invested money we barely had, to be honest, in a system that is still, and we're, we're nearly there with it. But this is, I mean, this is a cautionary tale, I guess. Uh, we did we did our we did our prep really well. We got a firm down from Ripon, uh, very used to cathedrals or, or, or larger church buildings, and we now have two cameras in the cathedral and three other cameras that we can use in the cathedral. Two two permanently placed cameras, all they all key into our audio system and so forth. We underestimated massively two things. One was the amount of training people needed to use that stuff, and the second was that our internet connection is rubbish. Uh, well, James, James, and uh, James and Tom knew that already from various things they tried to do already, but we haven't realised just how rubbish it was, and that has been the absolute bane of the autumn. So, you know, here we look, you know, cathedral. You think, well, you can do this stuff. It's easy to eat. It isn't. It isn't. Um, and we've worked out we actually need two people on the tech just to operate it uh, properly because you've got cameras swivel swiveling around, you've got sound levels, you've got all sorts of stuff so we're still only using two cameras but it does now work that's the amazing thing and 
sometime in the next three weeks, we'll probably have a high-powered Ethernet connection into the cathedral. So Tom and James, that is news this morning. So that means that we might be able to do an awful lot more for the building than we've been able to do, because that's our aim. Let me be clear. If this was just about getting worship across, we'd still be on the phone. Um, but actually, the cathedral is a convening place. Uh, cathedral is a diocesan place. Cathedral is bishop's place. Cathedral is a place where, you know, even things like a diocesan synod, not my favourite Sunday, Saturday morning, but there we are. You know, actually being able to broadcast that stuff properly and helpfully. One of the most moving moments was when I rang my old PA in my parish in Harrogate uh, just to get some updates on, on some people. And her mother had just died. And she said, oh, but of course, what we did is we had the whole service by Zoom. None of us actually went to church. We actually watched it by Zoom and it was amazing. And I thought, oh, so there's so much going on here that we need to be ready for. I don't think it has to be technically complicated, but, but I, do think, I do think quality begins to matter. Um, and that's why we're renewing our website, and that's why we've upped our game technologically in the cathedral. Um, I want to say something, uh, this goes back to a conversation with Alan some months ago, about the challenges of hybrid worship, um, if that's a good way of putting it. Our worship, our daily worship, the daily prayer, each of us does it in a different way. Um, I, I, I sing a lot and play the guitar a lot, which may or may not be helpful to anybody, but it amuses me. Um, I also do mini sermons on a daily basis. And again, it amuses me. I just hope I'll some other people enjoy that. Um, each of us does it differently and we really encourage that. There's a certain house style and it has a certain structure to it. Very simple, psalm reading, song prayer. Um, but that's been, you know, that's got a real stability to it. And of course it's to a very specific audience. This audience have chosen to be there uh, and they're only online. I think what we're finding with Sunday mornings is a lot more complicated. I thought it would be It's great when there's no congregation. Is that a terrible thing to say? <laughs> because when there's, when there's no congregation, I know exactly who I'm talking to. I face the camera and the camera swivels around to face me and you know, mostly it works. And sometimes my lips match what I'm saying, which is even better. Um, but that's easy because it's the same thing. I'm, I'm addressing and curating and developing an online audience online congregation, building this house of prayer, this virtual house of prayer that turns out to be real. In those Sundays, and we actually closed earlier than Christmas because the situation in Chelmsford was getting really dangerous by then, and we just didn't want to, you know, midnight mass, we normally get a thousand people, and even ticketing it, people would still show up. So that was getting really dangerous. So actually, we did those as, as live streams, midnight mass and Christmas morning. But the Sundays when we were meeting with a congregation were among the most emotionally challenging I've done in a long time, because who, who, who was the recipient of this? Who was, who, was the, who was the congregation? Now, you may have you know, had 300 people online, and our, our risk assessment at that point said 30 people in the cathedral. Who are we doing what for? And I think that's still a question I have, and I really want to continue to explore that question, because I think we need to attempt it. I raised it with a group of deans the other day, and of course I'd chosen the wrong audience because they said, well, you just do the normal service in the cathedral and people watch it. And I thought, well, that's a bit like, do you remember the old, um, the old New Year's Eve parties they used to have on television? Those ter you know, two old Scotsmen getting drunk in a studio. I don't want to watch somebody else's party. I want to be at the party and be an invited guest. And I think that's the real tension we have about streaming live worship with the congregation, um, which has also got a significant um, online audience. I don't think there's an answer to that yet, but I think we need, I think there's two things we need to do, do there, is some practical experience, but also I think this needs to be uh, some theological reflection. Uh, this is about, you know, virtual and real, uh, because I can see some dissonance working out in that space. I don't think it has done for us yet, but I don't really want to go down the line and say, we're just doing a normal service and other people can watch it if they want. This has got to be something that is, is inclusive of the online audience and the audience that's live. So I think to go back to the beginning, um, and you can ask me lots of questions if you want to. Um, all of them were together in the same place, to the, to the same place, it says in, in Acts 2. And that's a refrain throughout, throughout Acts. How do we gather when we can't gather physically, or even when we can gather physically, when we've garnered an online community? And when we've begun to curate that online community in a special way, and I was very struck by one of our one of our community who is uh, a GP. She's in her late fifties. Um, she's 
uh, been diagnosed with terminal cancer just before lockdown. I'm amazed she's still alive. But she made the point very strongly to me not so long ago that even when the cathedral is open for worship again, she's never going to be able to worship there. The online community is the only community she is going to have for the rest of her mortal life. That's quite a big challenge. Uh, we're actually, you know, sustaining somebody on their on their journey uh, towards the end, or rather, the new beginning. So that's got to be real. That's got to be deep. That's got to be serious, as well as uh, as well as inviting, as well as having a low threshold. Um, how do we do that with really limited resources? And cathedrals may seem very resourced. You know, actually, we're at the limits of our resourcing here. Um, but going forward, I, I want us to develop a robust theology of virtual being real and a sacramental community that knows, well, Eldad and Medad are my two favorite blokes in the Old Testament. If they're not familiar, Eldad and Medad, if you remember, God says to Moses, get the elders out in a particular space in a particular area and I will, I will you know, zap them, they will all prophesy. And what happens is Eldad and Medad are behind in the camp and they're meant to be out in the square where they're going to be zapped by God. And they're not there, but God still zaps them. Now, we know about it. I, I, physically being together is not the last word in God's action. Indeed, in a metaphysical universe, which seems to me is where God kind of works uh, pretty well, God is out there in all sorts of places, contexts, and so forth. If a Pennsylvania law professor, uh, a Californian, the odd French person, all sorts of people from all over the world, and even my daughter in Glasgow sometimes, can turn to prayer and feel it's real, then we need to do some serious thinking about what it means to build a house of, house of prayer together without walls. Cool. Thanks, Nicholas. I saw you, uh, I saw you winded in with uh, the deep theological uh, ending there. So I thought I'd jump in. <laughs> I thought, I, I thought I, he's, he's going he's gonna to end with something profound. I was warned in advance that Nicholas has got a, a, a brain the size of potentially a small moon. I don't know. Uh, when it comes to theology so I was you know I was prepared and following our discussion a couple of weeks ago um, uh, feel free to uh, raise hands or pop questions in the uh, chat um, just to get things going I had one of mine if that's all right just to get flowing um, so in terms of you know cathedral I know we spoke like you said a, a while back a couple of months ago and I know you sort of consider the cathedral as a a resource for the whole diocese it's like a it's on your heart to to you know not just do what you do but to to enable other churches across the diocese and it's a big old diocese obviously um what does resourcing or supporting other churches within the diocese look like digitally if you know what i mean do you feel do you feel like it can do or as a role to play in that I really hope so. And I mean, you know, Tom and James and you have been very supportive of some of the things that might be possible there. Um, I, I think that's, I think one of the things that early days, now this is a slightly different answer to your question. I was very struck by, by Janet Nichols, who many of you'll know as the rural chaplain for Essex. And Janet is one of these incredibly gifted people who can get alongside uh, rural communities in the most amazing way. And she uh, sent me an email saying, this, so this will be, you know, June time when we're sort of getting stuff out properly. And she said, um, you have connected with rural communities in Northeast Essex in a way they have never connected with the cathedral before, uh, because many of them have no capacity to continue worshiping online and they're connecting with you. Now, don't get me wrong, I do not want to claim that the cathedral has any wisdom in this area, but it seems to me, I've always, I've always had this line, the cathedral is the national church's free gift to the diocese. Now, it may be a rather oddly shaped free gift, um, but it is that, you know, the cathedral, the diocese does not pay a penny towards the cathedral, the parish share doesn't pay a penny towards the cathedral, you know, we're self-financing in those terms, but we are for the diocese, that's our job, is to be the church of the bishop and to share the scope of the bishop's ministry, which is the whole diocese. If we were a mission and ministry partnership, it would be the diocese that was the size of that. Um, so we're there for everybody, and my hope is that with our digital footprint, we can be more inclusive and also be properly resourcing not that we've got the answers i don't mean that but i think we've got a capacity uh, to enable encounters and so forth that 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 could be really helpful and i mean that on several levels 
Um, yeah, I mean, worship might be part of that. Uh, and our, our worship is quite various, although it's also quite formal at times. Uh, but I also think there's other things. I think neutral convening space, uh, some of the conversations I've already alluded to, you know, the conversations I'd love to have around virtual and real, which I don't think are abstract. I think they're really important questions about sacraments. What do they mean in, in a virtual world? How do we, how do we talk about uh, sacramental signs virtually? Um, uh, what does it mean for people coming to faith in a digital, fa in, a digi in a digital church? I'd love to find a way in which the cathedral can curate those conversations in, in an appropriate way, precisely because it, it is the bishop's church, not my church, it's the bishop's church, and therefore belongs to the diocese, and to use the resources which we have in order to serve those networks. Uh, you, you, you're singing my song there, my friend. Uh, I feel like we should just set a weekend apart to just have all this out theologically. It's it's really, you know, but anyway, I won't <laughs> I won't do that in here and now. People have but there's a couple of questions uh from uh one from Nick. Um how do you make what you do a part of the Anglican Church under canon law, etc.? Or is this the end of the Church of England? Big question there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. Of course, Simon Jenkins, you may have read Simon Jenkins' article in The Guardian a few weeks ago where, where that was one of his questions, but he was really talking about church buildings. I'm not that bothered about church buildings, which may seem an odd thing for a dean to say, but you know, I'm not, I don't run a branch of English heritage and never, never want to. So for me, the virtual and connected is much more important than the physical buildings. I think, we, I think there's all sorts of things we can do. I, I mean, the truth is, uh, rather, like, um, rather like moral debate and, and scientific... Uh, uh, experiment in our culture. I think the discovery of digital online worship has gone far ahead of, of canon law. Canon law needs to catch up with that uh, and enable it. I, just, I, I think it's that, that way around. Uh, I think we need to be versatile and provisional. And if that means that we sometimes transgress, I don't think that's problematic. I, I also, I mean, sorry, this, this, is a, this may be not an appropriate thing to say. Uh, certainly in my last church and at Chelmsford, I, I don't really think of myself as Church of England. I think of myself as a, a trans-denominational Christian. Um, if I look around the cathedral on a Sunday morning, well, it's empty at the moment, but um, on a typical Sunday morning in normal time, there are probably Christians of 12, 14 different denominations present. I've got a Baptist minister who worships there. I've got a Roman Catholic priest who worships there. We've got a Georgian Orthodox family. We've got a lot of Elim Pentecostals who worship there. I think that's the shape of the church of the future anyway. Um, so although we're Anglican by identity, and our worship I mean, certainly is canonically, you know, canonically obedient. I think the identity of the church, and I'm sure it's true in all of your churches, has changed radically in the last 20 years. And I think fewer and fewer people are intentionally denominational. Um, and if they are, that's probably the wrong kind of defended position. So I don't think it's the end of the Church of England, indeed, it, uh, but it's morphing into something that could be really very interesting. I do think, therefore, we have to take the opportunities for offered by the present to rethink, because I would suggest, and this is not a comment about worship or even online presence, this is a comment about structures, that we currently have structures that do not fit the mission ministry or, or frankly, daily life of the church as it is. Um, so rethinking those, what an opportunity. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Again, protein muscle. Um, so uh, there is another question from samuel lees but just before that uh, just to encourage you Gemma's had to go because she's uh had to rush off she's going to catch up with the rest later but she said thank you she's loving what you've been saying so uh yeah she's gone off to change the world based on what you said just so you know that um so a question from samuel says, thank you nicholas do you think there is any solution to the hybrid church situation other than doubling the workload, i.e. one physical service and then a separate online one. We certainly struggled with bridging the two in between lockdowns. I think that's a really good question and it's kind of the heart of not my struggle, but, but the questions I want to ask about, uh, about how you build one community out of this. I want to persevere with the hybrid model because I, I think you know, we'll learn some lessons even if we choose to do something else. I think the doubling up is also quite complex um, now, the cathedrals typically on a Sunday have four services, so you might say we do that anyway. At the moment, we only have one, and actually that's been amazing for us. I don't mean just mean because I got home earlier, that's not, not what I mean at all, but actually that we can, we can actually really resource one service 
rather than all being exhausted by doing four. Um, now, some people have found that difficult, but there we are. Um, I'm quite happy with that. Um, we've resisted doing recorded services. The only recorded services we, we did were kind of the set piece, um, the set piece uh, uh, Christmas services, though so nine lessons and carols, ceremony of carols, uh, stuff like that, where where just getting that right, and um, we wouldn't have been able to do that live, um, was was really important. The amount of work it takes to produce those services, it was enormous. Um, I remember a, a good mate of mine, um, um, Andy at uh, St John's in Colchester, uh, Andy Sachs. Um, he said to me uh, in, in the second lockdown, he said, um, you know, I'm spending almost half the week getting together the Sunday service, you know, because if you're going for quality um, and you, you're also building your skills, I think it's really hard. So I think recording a, another service will be very difficult. We do have other options on Sundays, of course, because we still do morning and evening prayer uh, as normal on a Sunday. And, and I'm very struck, Sunday morning prayer tends to be larger than the other days of the week. And that's clearly the part, partly the online community joining in. But I have been struck that the, that the online community for our hybrid worship, so to speak, has been significantly larger uh, than when we were just simply online. So, so I, I mean, this is going to be a real adventure, and I want to fra I phrase it that way, um, because I think, I want to, I mean, uh, uh, Sam, you, you, you've used the word struggle. I think we need to swink and sweat, to quote one of the medieval mystics. Um, uh, this, you know, swink and sweat. We, we've really got to work at this. I don't mean the hard technical thing. That's not hard. You know, there's loads of stuff that's straightforward about this. But I think we, that's why I think the thinking matters, because I don't mean we have to have it all philosophically correct or, or legally correct. But I think we have to think through what it is we're trying to do. And, and to use that phrase that's too often used, to begin with the end in mind, what do we really want this to look like? Uh, and I, I think, my, my hope is, that this will permanently change how we operate as a cathedral, and potentially permanently change how we operate uh, as churches in this diocese. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the hybrid model is the right one. Well, we discover that along the way. I, I tend to find things out by bumping into them. So, you know, I, 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 I learn by doing, and I often learn by doing the wrong thing. Um, but I think, to, and, and if this turns out to be the wrong thing, you know, we'll, we'll look at that. I actually think at the moment, it's really interesting. Um, so I, I want to live, I think living with the tension sometimes between something that that's, that's, that's we haven't quite worked out may, may lead us to a, to, a, to a deeper vision. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, as Sam, uh, Samuel's put, thank you, really helpful. Um, I mean, we've got a couple of minutes before we we finish. So if anyone's got any questions, um, and uh, you know, I really I want to sort of echo what Nicholas is saying because uh, it, we've got a few more of these webinars coming up. I'm just going to do a shameless plug for some future ones as well, and I'm hope I'm kind of hoping I'm going to send this across the box to Nicholas so that he, if he's if he's free. But we've got a couple of webinars coming up, one um, on the 2nd of February and then one on the 2nd of March. 2nd of February, we're going to be hopefully joined by a guy called Ali Johnson, who's a digital evangelist at Cliffs College. And then on the uh, 2nd of March, we're going to be joined by Pete Phillips, who runs a, an MA in digital theology, was at Durham, and they've now moved to get Oak Hill or something like that. And, um, and he heads up the digital premier um, conference. So, and they, they speak about hybrid church and, and those kind of things. And uh, I think what Nicholas is stirring there is some of these theological conversations people are dying to have. So uh, yeah, I think I'd encourage you to come along to those two. And then there's some in between as well. We're gonna be looking at some practicalities of using emails and stuff, but pop those in your diaries, tell your friends. Are there any more questions? Going. Sorry, I always seem to be asking questions. Uh, hello, Nick. Um, Nicholas, uh, another Manc exiled in Essex. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, just from a very practical point of view, I always wonder with morning prayer because it's so wordy, and really, if you're trying to follow it, you without having the words and the responses and so forth. How do you deal with that? Do you adapt the morning prayer that you use so it's more 
that you can watch it or are you expecting people to have the resources to participate no i think we i think we do both and and it's it's an invitation really so the order of the order of service is on is on the website if people want it truth is because most of us have diverged in different ways it's been quite funny so um, there's one bloke who who write, likes copying out the text on the screen on on the Facebook page, and I suddenly think, well, I, actually, we didn't use that bit today, um, and 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 I think we all curate it differently. So I think what people are used to is this really quite simple structure, and we use we use I mean, we we take some liberties with the lectionary, but I think that you know I've, I've always done that to be honest because it seems to be that's within the discretion of the minister and I'm the minister, um, and I, I, but I, I mean don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely committed to lectionary lectionary because I love being confronted with a very difficult gospel reading that I have to explain. I mean, one of the highlights for me of the first lockdown was we were reading through the book of Numbers. And I thought, really? And so we started reading through the book of Numbers and I thought, how on earth do, you know, what do we do with this? Um, and then I discovered, I didn't know this, um, uh, that in, in the Hebrew Bible, the books are named after the first words of the, of the book. So the book of Numbers in Hebrew is called In the Wilderness. And suddenly, being in the wilderness, outside the promised land, trying to work out what happened next, which is exactly what the Israelites are doing, became the most important narrative of lockdown. So, so I think what we found is the texts that are presented, be they Psalms, be they readings, uh, be they you know, a really challenging saying of Jesus. We don't talk, to, well, I, I suppose we're seeking to constantly chat through it. So I chat through the whole thing, even though I do quite a lot of chanting as well, which is a bit weird. Um, so, so I think, I think they, I mean, the, one of the interesting questions is when, when we can pray the, office, the daily prayer together again, how's that going to feel? Well, we've had all this freedom. How are we going to get back together, the four of us, uh, and, and, and meet twice a day? Um, but I was surprised, again, because I think your question is right. You know, some of this is quite complex stuff, if you're not careful. Uh, for, a few, few, uh, for about a month, we had choral evensong back in the cathedral on a weekday. And that's kids singing, singing evensong, basically. And I thought, oh no, the online community is going to disappear. And he basically got a handful of people in the cathedral. Well, actually, the online community doubled for Coral Evensong. And I thought, well, I, I wouldn't be clocking into this if I wasn't here. Um, but so, so I think it's really interesting. And I think, I think one of the things, and, and I, I, I'm not claiming this for cathedrals, but, but I think words, words matter less if you, if you, I mean, I think sung words, you know, sung faith sticks when spoken words don't always do it. I think the other thing that's going on in our culture more widely, and people like Linda Woodhead have written about this, and I, I, I think it's really interesting, is the re-ritualization of culture. Um, you know, everybody goes to, every student goes to a graduation these days. We never did in the 1980s. It was simply uncool. You know, I, I better pick, my, pick up my degrees one day, I suppose, but you know, so uncool to do that stuff. Uh, the, the Vice Chancellor of the local university here, who's absolutely not a Christian, he said, you know, now that he's seeing the re-ritualization of culture in the way universities are working. Modern universities, which abandoned all the pomp and circumstance, are actually reinventing it. And I think there's a, there's a we're seeing that in, in, in the younger generation of, uh, of people who, who respond to sacrament, ritual, and patterns in a way that simply wasn't true even 10 years ago. Um, and I don't know how to do that online, except I light a lot of candles and, um, and, and chant a lot. Uh, but that's, but uh, that's that, that sounds a bit silly. So I, I think text is ameliorated by sign, symbol, and ritual action, and that may sound very churchy, but I don't think it is. I mean, I think one of the one of the you may know the anecdote to evidence report that came out in 2014, and uh, and that spoke of cathedral growth because cathedrals, bizarrely, uh, until lockdown, have been the fastest growing kinds of churches in England, and nobody quite knows why. Um, but something is, it's something to do with stability, uh, uh, which seems to, seems, and, and that ritual is predictable as well as being unpredictable in some of the ways we do it. I think all of this is not about a style of worship though. It's about how we curate that in relationship. Now, the church is not an organization, it's a relational community. Mm. And I think, you know, I suppose the biggest takeaway from the whole experience of doing online worship for me is these have become real relationships. And then a pattern of prayer becomes embedded in that relationship, but the relationship is foundational. Awesome. What a bombshell to end on. Great. Um, so we are bang on time. And um, if you've got 
any other questions or anything like that, obviously do, uh, you know, message us. I'm sure we can we can connect somewhere in this connected world that we're in. Um, but yeah, just bear in mind, you know, we've got um, in a couple of weeks time, as I said, I mentioned before, we've got a session around. It's a, it, we've, we're trying to mix these up with some kind of theology and some practical, uh, you know, some basics and some little more advanced. We're trying to, you know, roll these out. So um, I think on the website somewhere there's a, I might need Tom in a minute, but just to say there's a, if you've got any feedback, do just send us some feedback on the sessions because we, we're hoping to carry these on even beyond March, I guess, and, you know, in different forms and to keep these conversations going on all levels practical basic and theological so uh do send that feedback in and um just to say a big thank you for joining us i guess is there anything else tom i'm presuming tom's frozen <laughs> in a very serious <laughs> stern based way oh no that's he's back. right I'll, I'll, is he back oh i was gonna say i'll uh, join you uh, yeah but there's there's too much uh too much streaming going on in this house um, he, um uh, yeah we'll send we'll send a follow-up email um we're, we've got a bit of a backlog because we've got to get the one out for the sessions and the recordings out for the sessions last week but there'll be a there'll be an email in the next couple of days and there'll be a feedback form in there um as well as uh, use some useful links and details of the other forthcoming uh, webinars awesome great well a big thank you for to tim and sarah and to uh, nicholas as well it was awesome you know it's from the the basics of filming in your living room to the uh, ground narrative of the cathedral it was awesome thanks so much and uh, right, God bless everyone and uh, have a good night and have a rest from Zoom and hopefully we'll see you next time.